uh, again, I encourage um, just asking questions throughout the uh, throughout the presentation in the chat. Um, and uh, like Suzanne mentioned, if I may not get to it immediately if I know that I'm going to come to a, a, a related uh, uh, point in a bit, and I um, usually just wait until that moment and then um, answer the question as, as they come. But I've, um, the last year of, uh, of teaching remotely has sort of taught me to be uh, flexible in terms of uh, questions and being able to sort of um, go on the fly a little bit. So just very really briefly, uh, my name is Adrian Jordan. I'm an associate professor at uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm also the director of the Gloucester Marine Station. I shouldn't say research there. Um, and uh, also a, a faculty member for uh, graduate faculty in a number of different departments, including um, the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is my home department within the School of Earth and Sustainability. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, just get started, I guess. So I really uh, study fish and habitats. And so what we have here are a bunch of shiners and there's a number of species. I can see some yellow perch and some brown bullheads sort of swimming by. And you'll notice that these fish are kind of associated with the bottom, all right? So they're what we call benthic fish. They're um, not all of them, but most of them I would say are, are associated with the bottom, um, including those white suckers now that you can sort of see that there, you often notice their mouths like almost pulsating, and they have a certain habitat association with, with uh, the bottom. Um, the herring are sort of swimming across the top right now, and, um, and so they're, they're not, and they'll come back in a little bit. They um, are a very different fish than these benthically oriented fish. They're a pelagic fish, so a fish that lives up in the water column, and, uh, and that creates a, a difference, like they operate in a different habitat than many of these other fish do, and that, that carries over to the ocean too. Um, and, but they do interact and, and these herring, which are now gonna start flooding through, do not just move as one, all right? They move as like a group, as a school of fish. And that is a, a big part of their behavior and a big part of, um, of our work is sort of focused on this. This happened to me all the time last summer. I get photobombed by these, uh, by these bluegills and pumpkin seeds. I think because if you're looking at my video, because the camera that I was using um, has a lens on it that looks like an eye. <laughs> I think that just got the got the eye of those pumpkin seeds, but it's pretty funny. I got I got photobombed every time I had a camera in the water in fresh water. Um, so the herring are a very unique species, but uh, we still have to sample them. So I'm just going to run through very briefly a couple of our sampling um, techniques, just so you can sort of get a flavor of something we do. And I'm not just showing video and you know and data. Um, so these this is just a typical beach scene. Um, this is in the era of COVID, you can tell, because we have our face masks on. This is actually just after we had gotten the okay with our reopening plans to, to start doing field research again. So we were um, doing some both, um, I was doing this videoing for a class, but also doing some uh, training uh, for, um, for our uh, technicians and students who are gonna be working on the project. So essentially this pulls in and, and captures fish in a small um, bag at the end of the net, and then you can put them in a bucket, enumerate them, count them, ID them, and uh, get data from them. Uh, we actually use boats um, most often um, for deploying these kinds of nests. This is just another type of beach stain, which is a little different. It actually has a rope attached to either end, and, uh, and we uh, back the boat up, deploy the net overboard, and then use the lines to pull it in. And obviously I sped this up. This is not how quickly we operate, <laughs> um, but it's a really boring video to watch in, in real time. Um, as you know, as nice as it is to be outside and everything, uh, watching videos, someone setting a saying, um, oh my goodness, how has COVID disrupted our research? That That is a, a probably a research uh, topic in itself, um, but I'll try and answer a little bit as I go along. Uh, mostly we, did, we weren't allowed to get out in the field until it was late, late July by the time our university had a protocols in place for us to apply for research ability to do research. That was the big thing. Most federal and state surveys were skipped net last year, so we're gonna have huge data gaps um, in terms of understanding uh, many of the fish that um, we study. And I'm also on the, um, on the um, Science and Statistical Committee for the New England Fisheries Management Council and the, the federal trawl survey didn't go out and they're really concerned about what that means for those data series. And it, it's impacted us. We really like uh, getting samples in, uh, in June, June and July, not August, September, October, like we did last year, um, mostly because they're in peak abundance in these freshwater habitats. So it impacted us quite a lot, but we were able to finally get out. And so it wasn't quite as catastrophic as it could have been. We also were able to get some of our uh, lab work done. 
So for catching river herring, um, because I mentioned they're pelagic, um, they, um, and this actually was a big part of the COVID, we, we have to get three people on a boat. And so it's about positioning people in, 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 a, in a safe way. And it's also about, um, you know, everybody wearing face masks and going through these proper protocols. So th this, um, this net works a little differently. Instead of setting it from shore and pulling it to shore, you set it out in the open water. And the lines that are being pulled by, looks like Matt and Tyler, um, are actually slide through a series of hoops on the bottom of the net that allow it to be pulled taut um, and, and create a purse, which is why this is called a purse stain. It's operated a lot in, um, in Atlantic herring and um, mackerel, uh, sorry, and menhaden fisheries in the ocean um, and has some application for freshwater sampling, but we've, we've relied very heavily on this and actually have a paper uh, discussing its precision and accuracy in terms of uh, measuring a, a density and abundance of uh, river herring in freshwater ponds. So basically once you get the purse uh, uh, done. The, the net has basically trapped everything in it. You pull the net overboard until you end up with a small little um, uh, patch of uh, net that um, basically contains all the fish in it. And then we try and release almost everything alive. I love this video because Doug here, we use a trolling motor. Uh, the trolling motor has flown off the <laughs> boat in the middle of sampling. And uh, I use this to just say, you know, when things go wrong in the field, you don't panic. Um, even if you're also realizing that all of a sudden now great waves are coming by and you're, you know, everyone's getting a little nervous and, you know, the net's starting to drift underneath the, the, uh, the, the boat. But Doug does this so expertly and I think he was only on the job for about a month at this time. And this is when I knew we had, we had a good one um, and him, he just sort of dealt with it, got it done. And, and then you bring the net in and, and you can um, proceed exactly the same way with the beach stain. Um, you get the fish into a bucket and then you can enumerate and ID them and, and so forth. So... Fortunately and unfortunately, um, the net doesn't really work very well in the daytime. Um, so all of our field sampling for river herring currently occurs um, for, for juveniles um, while, while they're in headwater ponds occurs at night, which is amazing because you get to come out and just witness the world uh, on the water that um, that most people are, are headed home for. You know, in fact, we're headed out and people are headed back to the dock um, at the end of a fishing day. and. Um, the reason for this we found was because the, the fish are schooling in ways that are different. And the other thing about being out in the ocean is that you, uh, during the night is you get to see things you just wouldn't have seen otherwise. And so this is a little squid, a very small one um, that was um, that was in our uh, persane, which we I took this video of and then re uh, released um, alive into the water, which is why we like the persane as well. It's a very effective way of sampling, um, but allows those um, those fish to, so we re retain some for, for processing, but we um, release the vast majority of them alive. Um, so this is an old fish that was in a freezer, which is why it's not looking very good. It's also an adult, but I just wanted to show, like we, we go through each of these fish and because there are three river herring species that are, uh, you know, if you want to classify shad as a river herring as well, um, it's, you have to ID them and it's not, it's really difficult when they're young, but I just thought it would be helpful to show, um, you know, the process of sort of figuring out what these fish are um, through a series of um, first figuring out the, the morphology of the, of the fins and where they are in relation to one another. And then that allows you to sort of say, okay, this is in the herring group of species uh, based on the, based, mostly based on, on actually the positions of those fins. Um, and then, um, it, the thing that separates the river herrings is a losa group from the other herrings is this um, is the saw belly, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. And so I'm just showing it nicely here with a ruler and then I show it with a glove and eventually, of course, it tears the glove. Um, and I'm going to just fast forward in this video. Um, once you get into the species, you're actually having to, you have to start using um, morphology of the jaw as well as the coloration on the interior of their perineum to, and, and their stomach lining to sort of ID them. And it um, becomes a lot more challenging. And I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to turn this over and eventually look, on, um, look at that stomach lining. But that's actually not what I want to show here. I want to just stop here for a second. So here's a gill of the fish. And, and this is the reason why I'm showing this is for a couple of, for, for the primary reason they're a really important um, fish. Um, so they are a, a forage fish. They're small and consume a lot of the really small zooplankton and stuff that are in the water. And the way they do that, so this is a gill on the right side of the image, I assume the red sort of darker side of, the, of this is the gills. And obviously that functions the same way as our lungs do, except in water, it takes in oxygen out of the water and, and gets rid of CO2. 
Um, and that's a whole, probably a whole of talk in itself, um, gills, but um, that's all I'm saying today. On the other side, where you see sort of that series of little fine, um, uh, like almost bristles, like combs, that is, um, that's uh, their gill rakers. And so they use these gill rakers to actually filter out the much the same way that persane was, but instead it's, you know, operating a little bit differently. You can think of it sort of like baleen in a whale. Um, it use, they use these uh, gill rakers to filter out the zooplankton that's in the water. And, um, and, and actually herring do this, um, menhaden do this as well, pogies, but, um, but actually feed sm on smaller items than Atlantic herring and uh, river herring do. Um, Atlantic herring, river herring feed on about the same fraction of the zooplankton, sort of medium body to large body zooplankton, if, they're, if that's available. They'll eat other things too if it's not. Um, they also will direct, directly forage on items as well, but they rely very, very heavily on this set of gill rakers to filter out their food um, while they're swimming around. And in fact, if you would knew that and then looked at what was going on in that water, um, you would have seen two things going on. One of them uh, in, the, in the image I showed in the video I showed earlier, you would have seen that some of them are sort of swimming around and you can see that they're targeting individual um, something in the water that they're, they see and they, and they want to eat, but they're also just filtering the, um, that out at the same time. So they sort of use both those strategies. And because later on, I'm going to probably mention otoliths and I often forget to, to say something about them. Um, we also use otoliths a lot. Um, and so most of the fish that we do sample um, as part of our field work is actually the juveniles, which are between five and 50, 155 millimeters. So very, very small to reasonably small. Um, and uh, those fish are uh, placed on a, on a, uh, on a, on a, um, a slide basically. And then we use these jeweler forceps to extract um, the otoliths, which are these tiny little bones that are find, found. They're essentially part of their ear bones. And in fact, their, their movement related to pressure waves in the water is actually how, um, how they're used. They, they have a number of different bones and they'll, they'll vibrate differently depending on the pressure wave because of their size. And that allows the fish in a very in a way that I don't think we fully understand, uh, but it does allow them to sort of understand what's going on and orient themselves in the water um, with other complicated things like their lateral line. So we take these otoliths and then mount them on a slide in resin and often have to do a little bit of polishing, but with these small sizes, we don't. They grow um, rings based on the days um, and night cycle because they have differences in activity between day and night. And so that sets up a, a pattern in uh, growth uh, that um, that lays down these rings, which are associated with each day. So you can actually figure out when these fish were um, were hatched, or when they were um, initially first had an otolith, which is not when they first, um, when, not when they hatch, it's actually a little before when they hatch, and it's obviously before their uh, spawning date. But you can use some understanding about how long it takes for the fish to develop to the point where the otoliths occur to sort of figure out when these fish are being spawned in these ponds. Very, very helpful. And then the distance between these, uh, these uh, rings, which are called increments, um, actually are, um, should relate almost in uh, directly to the growth rates. And so these otoliths capture information about the, the how old these fish are, when they spawned, and then how the fast they're growing um, uh, over time. And if you have uh, information like the temperature at the time, at the at specific dates, at specific times, like we do in many of our sites, then you can actually start linking these increment growths to the temperature. And we have a graduate student working on that. So with that, I think it's really important for me to point out that I am just not the only person working on this stuff that I'm about to go over. We are very, very, very fortunate to have a, a great group of um, uh, first the other uh, PIs on grants that I'm working on river herring with. So that would be uh, Dr. Allison Roy in the USGS uh, Massachusetts Co-op uh, co unit here at, uh, at the uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, also Ms. Stell Stogginger, who's in the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. I realized I got to change that acronym. And then Lisa Komorowski, who's also in the same department as I am, who works on uh, more genetics, genomics, and physiology. And we each have a small project or a large project, depending on who, the, who it is, uh, focused on river herring. Um, we also have some associated fa uh, faculty who I'm not going to go one by one through. And of course, our graduate students are ultimately the, the people really doing the work on this. And I'm going to pay homage to them later on as I discuss some of the work that we're doing um, on this. We have a we employ a large group of undergraduates uh, for, for otolith extraction and processing. Um, those that are really good move on and in, often into the actual processing, but many of them, it's just the extraction is just a hugely time consuming step, um, you know, which some folks really love because it's like doing yoga. Other people hate because it's really boring. Um, just depends on uh, your, your, your interests. Um, we also work, um, 
cl very, very closely with um, the Massachusetts Division of uh, Marine Fisheries, as well as actually Connecticut um, Deep and, um, and uh, other federal and state agencies, as well as NGOs like the Nature Conservancy, um, but also with many watershed associations, including the Mystic River Watershed Association, um, among many others. Um, and we count on these partnerships um, to be able to do our research. And then of course we have a, a number of funders and including our most recent funding from Woods Hole Sea Grant, which I'm gonna discuss sort of towards the end of the talk. So I, I do, I, I am certainly one of the leads on all of our work, but um, I, I just would not be able to do any of what I'm about to describe if it wasn't for the hard work of all of our dedicated team. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes just talking about um, climate change, because I think that it's important for everybody to be sort of on the same page with, with this. Um, and um, I often would jump really forward right into the river herring work that we're doing, but I wanted to provide at least some kind of primer on, te on temperature effects. And so here what we have is a NOAA um, uh, product which shows the changing um, conditions around, uh, you know, in the region associated with um, changes in the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And so two things are going on. So first there's a change in salinity and then there's a change in temperature. I really want you to focus on the change in temperature. And as you see towards the end, you'll start seeing warmer and water, warmer and warmer water entering into the Gulf of Maine. And the Gulf of Maine is a typically fairly cold water system because it receives this input from uh, more Northern uh, flows of water. But we are starting to see, as you are, I'm sure well aware, um, we're, we're seeing a rapid warming in the Gulf of Maine, which is associated with these regional patterns in uh, circulation and, and uh, coastal currents. So what, what, we're, what we're going to see is, is an int intensification of these changes, um, especially uh, in terms of uh, the combination of the salinity and temperature, which act on in terms of stratification. And so um, we are not only seeing a change in the temperature, we are also seeing, honestly, I do not know what year zero is, to be honest. Um, I'd have to go back to the original um, document to look at that, um, but I can, I can track that down and show it to you. So two, two things are occurring here. One of them is that the temperature is changing, but the other thing is that, the, um, that we're also getting changes in patterns of rainfall, precipitation, snow, and, and well, we're getting tons of snow today, but um, snow and, and rain sort of distributed over the seasons. And for a fish like river herring who are anadromous, those changes may be just as impactful as the temperature change um, on a, you know, in, in terms of uh, impacting them. But I like to talk about how this global warming is going to impact fish from these two different perspectives because they're very different and they're going to work together and going to really impact um, um, just the, the state of, uh, state of things uh, moving forward. So the first one is this biologically mediated processes and that is because for these fish that are um, you can call them cold blooded or poikilothermic. That means that their, their internal body temperatures essentially match the external temperature because their gills are in intimate contact with the water. So they're basically constantly keeping themselves at whatever temperature they're being, um, being uh, um, exposed to. Um, their enzyme activity rates and their entire metabolism is tied as everyone's is to temperature, all right? So we maintain our temperatures relatively steady, obviously it goes up and down a little bit, depending on if you're in a freezing cold basement like I am right now, or if you're um, just happen to be running a little warm and obviously um, there's uh, uh, illness that um, we, we are all being exposed to that has um, some of the same impacts that we do get. We do have fluctuations in temperature, but it's nothing like one of these po uh, poikilothermic animals. And so they are essentially like, their bodies will change to that condition. I'll cover this a little bit more in a second. The other one though, is that we are going to see a lot of habitat medi mediated effects. And so sea level change and habitat loss is what I'm gonna focus on, but you just have to imagine that actually the prey resources and everything that these fish are depending on are also changing as this climate is changing in the background. So um, I love mummy chugs, so, and I'm sure you guys have been exposed to them um, in your time at Wells because they are just a very, very ubiquitous, um, a common uh, species in the coastal zone. Um, but I think I have a better slide. So I'll start with this. So the black arrows are sort of like the optimum temperature. The box is sort of where that fish could live. The arrows are where it could like maybe be okay. And the thin arrows would be like where it could go for a few seconds, but if it stays there, it's going to die. And then beyond any of the arrows, 
the fish can't live in those conditions. So these are two very hypothetical species, although I kind of tailored them into the two examples that I have um, that I'm showing. So one of them, the top one, which has these wide bars um, associated with its ability to conform to temperature is what we would call a urothermal organism or something that can handle wide ranging temperatures. It still has bounds though, for which it can live in, it's not like it can live in any temperature. It's just that it can be exposed to wide temperature uh, changes and be okay with it. And it has adapted a flexible met metabolic system that can, can ac accommodate that basically. Um, and there's a number of ways they do that that are again, a little beyond this talk. The other species is not, um, is not adapted to a lot of temperature change. It has a very specific set of conditions that it likes to live in. If it deviates much from that, they, they immediately start having impacts here. And then very quickly, they end up in a, in a, in a uh, place that they, uh, they can't survive. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about, this. so there's basically two ways to think about, about this, uh, about this climate uh, vulnerability. One of them is your sensitivity. So I just sort of covered that. That's the how sensitive you are to these changes and then your exposure is like how much you're going to be exposed to these changes based on where you live and your and your behavior and as you're going to notice um no i didn't do it but it up in this like top right um you see atlantic salmon and base scallops um those are highly very high both sensitivity and exposure um atlantic salmon um I, I don't think I need to go into that um, very much, but base scallops because they're they're obviously uh, pretty close to the shore for the most part. Um, and then in that next box down, you get all most of the anadromous, other anadromous species, alewives, blueback herring, American shad. So they're a highly, highly sensitive, highly exposed set of species um, to uh, effects of climate because they make these migrations all the time, and that makes them exposed so changes both across the terrestrial ecosystems but also marine ecosystems both offshore inshore and so that creates this this perception at least of um of high exposure i am going to point out that at this at this moment that i am in some ways uncomfortable with with this characterization of 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 river herring because i i believe them since they are found um in much much lower latitudes than here all the way down into they used to be found um really high abundance all the way down to florida that's changed a little bit more recently but but these fish are are are, are widely distributed from historically from florida to labrador and so we're and we're right in sort of the center of the range and so i get a little bit uncomfortable with the idea that they're going to be really impacted by climate change but um in terms of negative effects but but i do think that we should be aware of the fact that um, they are certainly going to experience uh, uh, negative impacts across their entire range and in specific unique circumstances where the uh, where the systems are allowed to really warm up in certain under certain conditions that are going to clearly have bad impacts we see temperatures that are are, are causing the impacts on these species um, already um, so so it's not to say there is no impact i just think that um, I think for, for a fish like Atlantic salmon, whose range basically we're on the southern extent of its range, so you don't find them further south than uh, Maine really right now. I mean, there's a very residual number left in Connecticut River, but other than that, um, you know, it's really Maine north. And so of course they're gonna be highly sensitive, whereas um, things that are found all the way down south um, to uh, Florida, maybe. Time will tell. So going back to the mummy chug. Mummy chugs, um, I, I ran into them a lot. I did a lot of work in Acadia National Park. And actually back then, Michelle Dion from Wells was on my committee. I really enjoyed my time uh, visiting her at the at Wells. And I wish I could be there in person today, obviously, as well. Um, but um, I, I was sampling a lot of these in, in the, in the uh, main, main coastal zone. And they're just a very very adaptable species. So I, I had them in traps, which, um, which I had a, a, a a temperature logger in and it recorded temperatures that would vary from 10 degrees Celsius to over 30 degrees Celsius based on the incoming cold water tides that would come in in Acadia, get some pretty cold um, ocean water there, um, as well as this warming on this uh, salt marsh surface um, of that whatever water was left at low tide would really elevate those temperatures, especially if that water was standing. These fish didn't, they don't care. They just live in that environment and they're and they able to, uh, to deal with it um, just fine. And in fact, that ability makes them really common because not a lot of other organisms can, uh, with the exception of probably silver sides. 
Whereas on the opposite uh, side of the spectrum, there's this crocodile ice fish, which is an Antarctic species. Um, it can only tolerate about, a, you know, it could not tolerate more than about a three degree temperature change. It's um, within the Southern Ocean, which essentially is locked in its own conditions. Very, very little variation on, uh, on annual and uh, even decadal timescales maybe things will start getting messed up in the future. We see some really big impacts in the um, Southern Ocean, potentially uh, um, from climate change. So this species would be really badly impacted if the temperature were to change. In fact, it would pretty immediately go extinct because it's just not, it's not adapted for those kinds of changes. And so that sets up these sort of stenothermal tight temperature uh, range versus uh, more urethermal, um, in the case of the mummy chug, can deal with lots of different temperatures. I want to point out that um, the, there is not only um, a temperature effects, there's also increasing CO2 levels, which are causing this um, deoxygenation and acidification of water, as well as um, uh, um, the, well, the acidification um, being uh, really important for some of these other uh, species like uh, mollusks and shelled organisms that require a certain acidity in the water enabled to, to be able to create their shells. Um, but also these other impacts are going to are going to uh, also be felt by other species. And so I don't want it to seem like the only thing that's going on is temperature change. There are multiple impacts and it's very difficult to study this. Um, this is a slide from uh, a great friend of mine um, and colleague, Hannes Baumann, who's down at the uh, University of Connecticut at Avery Point. Um, he's uh, done a lot of uh, temperature studies um, with uh, acidification in the lab, uh, really great work. And um, this is actually a great lecture by Aslo. And if you guys, he's, he gives like a very good talk. So that'd be maybe someone who could talk, uh, focus on in the future. He's done a lot of work on silver sides. Um, so then the second side of this, so we have this whole biologically mediated. So temperature is gonna affect organisms because it has a fundamental effect on their metabolism um, and also the metabolism of all the other species that they're interacting with. And then we have this other side of things, which is that the sea levels are increasing and rising um, because of both the melting of ice sheets and so forth, but also just because the ocean's gotten warmer. And as the ocean gets warmer, just the same as your pot of coffee in the morning or your kettle as you start to heat it up, we have a terrible kettle that just like every morning, if you, if you Keep, if you take your eyes off of it, it'll start spewing out all the water uh, pretty quickly. It's a little bit of a different process of, in our terrible kettle, but, but if you warm up a, 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 a water that is a brimmed at the top of a cup or something, it will overflow because um, water expands as the, um, as the electrons are moving around more, more um, rapidly. And so um, th those two things together are increasing our sea level and it's, it's clearly happening. It has major impacts on what we do, but it also, is going to um, influence the amount of marsh habitat that's available in the future, especially if we haven't planned for the, these changes and therefore we lose marsh as the ocean starts hitting um, the, uh, the, the private properties and cities and towns that sit behind these marshes often. And so we, I, we have a lot of work to think, th think th through this and sort of figure out what we're gonna do. Um, but I think it's a major concern and we should really, um, I, I worry, it's one of the things I worry most about actually. Um, because we can't lose marsh. Marshes are hugely productive and a major part of our ecosystems, even though we don't think of them like that. They're a really um, important component of coastal ecosystems. There's a lot of production in there and uh, it would it would fundamentally change our marine ecosystems if we were to lose marshes. So um, the other thing that's happening though is that distributions of prey are, are changing. And so in the bottom here, we have a, a picture like that might have been a video at some time, but um, we have uh, uh, where the Atlantic herring were in the spring in 1968 is down off of Long Island. I'll, I'll just tell you, if you watch, if you look at this information for many years, you'll see that you do not get herring down that far very much anymore at all. Um, they're really a Gulf of Maine uh, species now, and we've seen the shifts of many species and then some of the lower trophic levels like this phytoplankton that I sort of just threw in the, in the bottom right here, um, we, we don't really understand what's going on, but we do know that patterns of both uh, stratification, warming, salinity are all going to influence where and how much of these organisms are available for other species to prey on. And obviously you can start seeing how this is all linked together and I'll, I'll try and capture that in one of the last slides of the talk. So you can sort of imagine that we're losing this habitat, we're having all these changes and that, you know, there's going to be impacts for many of these uh, species uh, that are using these coastal habitats um, in, in the future. 
So basically we have two options. Uh, we, you know, where these species have two options. They have the uh, brace, brace yourself. We're going to stick a stick in here and hopefully we can adapt quick enough to the, these changes, or maybe they have enough plasticity already in their, in their makeup, like mummy chugs, where they're going to be okay because they're, they, they've lived in those conditions over the time of their ecological history or evolutionary history. And they, they are going to be able to, uh, to handle those or um, you get out uh, really quick. And, um, and so we're seeing both of these things happen. Um, and, uh, and actually one of the things that we find the most interesting is, is how some species are probably going to hunker down and sort of just try to ride, ride out whatever occurs where other ones are going to, their, their populations are going to shift. And it's actually that interaction between species that are resident and not moving so much. And those that are migratory in particular and moving, um, are going to change over time as these, um, as these strategies, uh, differ among species. And in fact, uh, work that I've done with, with Michelle Stogginger, um, and in fact, a paper that she published last year or two years ago, probably even three years ago at this point, um, is uh, shows that the, in fact that response is variable among species. And I, I think that there's a real opportunity, but also a real um, a real risk of having some pretty uh, significant ecosystem in, um, disruptions. And I often actually have a series of slides showing a. A, uh, a handoff of a baton in a in a relay race and some really messed up versions of that and not being able to complete the real relay race is sort of showing this um, this inability to to pass energy along in a food web because of these in, in a, these lack of interactions that we um, that the species used to have. So river herring specifically have these two forms: an anadromous and a landlocked form. There are two species that we typically think of in this rare river herring bucket, alewife and blueback herring. Um, they're slightly different. Um, boy, we've really, we've done a lot of work on both species and they seem very similar in most ways, um, but clearly there are two different species. And so, um, but they do hybridize in, in some low level in many systems and they're just a really interesting, they're an interesting tandem, um, have slightly different ranges, have slightly different um, thermal uh, tolerances, it's, it appears anyway, um, although um, I have a student showing some information that might contradict that um, down the road. But, um, you know, just very uh, ubiquitous coast, coast wide, especially historically, we've done a lot of historical ecology work, which I'm not going to touch on today, just showing how widespread they would have been, um, given um, the pre dammed um, uh, landscape in, in uh, North America. So there are two, two basic groupings of both um, alewife and blueback can landlock as actually can Atlantic salmon and even the other anadromous fish and completely unrelated taxa um, like uh, uh, lampreys um, have also done that in the Great Lakes um, and other couple other places. So um, these anadromous species seem very adaptable and able to both to, to uh, take on these uh, landlocked life forms, which essentially just uh, end up a lot smaller because they don't get into the ocean where they can feed on these large uh, quantities of copepods that are produced there. Um, so at least that's, that's the way I think about it. Um, and so uh, there's been a lot of controversy about river herring and most of it has come down to not understanding the difference between the impacts of a landlocked population of alewives that um, graze down the zooplankton all the time and can be really significant competitors, <coughs> can also uh, create the thymus deficiency in some of the uh, predators because they're they're all the time. They're really the only prey available because they can uh, drown out other prey, including smelt, which actually also can give thymes, <laughs> uh, thymine de deficiency uh, to, uh, to predators. But then uh, the, the anadromous version of this uh, of, of river herring leave the system for large periods of the year. And so they're, they're not at all the same kind of impact on um, freshwater predators as do um, the landlocked versions and do very different things to the zooplankton as well. They graze it down very heavily while they're there, but then they leave and the zooplankton recovers and can support a lot of other different species. And what we're finding actually is that, um, that anadromous fish, because of their reproduction and spawning and depositing loss of eggs and uh, young fish, um, drive a lot of patterns in, uh, in their predators as well as in the prey and have really important but not negative effects on, on freshwater ecosystems. Feeding size selective, as I mentioned before, they have those sieves in their uh, gill arches that basically will take out a certain size because of that they can alter zooplankton communities. Um, and I just wanted to point out that these anadromous and landlocked forms play very different um, roles in ecosystems. And I really encourage people who are like, they're bad to, to concentrate on the fact that 
landlocked populations can have negative effects. They're actually also stocked to support uh, uh, sport fish, but um, but those impacts that the landlocked variety have are not the same at all as the anadromous fish that are being um, promoted through uh, restoration. So I'm sure you're all aware of the river herring life history, um, but if you're not, um, nah, you can absolutely share this with your board or I can, you can invite me and I'll come and uh, give a better uh, talk that uh, focuses most on, it's very frustrating. It's one of my biggest frustrations in working on river herring. No problem. Um, so river herring are, um, they're like most anadromous fish, um, they spend the vast majority of their lives actually in, in salt water, um, you know, one to four years before they return. So we'll start in their, in their majority of their lives, which actually we know not, almost nothing about um, in, the, in the ocean. So they enter into lakes and streams and in, in the uh, in river systems in the spring. Um, somewhere between, actually, if you extend across their entire range, if that, those dates actually become more to February to um, late May, maybe even early June um, in the far north. Um, and uh, they, they're, they reproduce um, as many times as they possibly can while they're in um, fresh water. They'll create a series of batches of eggs. Um, we don't quite know how many, probably three or four uh, separate spawning events that separated by about a week to two weeks. Um, but I'm starting to get a little bit hand wavy at this point, um, but it's something like that. Um, those eggs are slightly adhesive and demersal, so they sit on the bottom. Um, therefore, things like some of those suckers and things will probably eat a lot of those eggs, and it produces a lot of energy in the ecosystem that is coming from outside the system, which is different than the anadromous uh, species, or different than the landlocked species. And then those eventually hatch into those weird spaghetti-looking things with that little ball on it. That little ball is a yolk sac, and that is a little bit of the parental investment. I know for us, we invest a lot more than just a little yolk sac into, into our offspring. In fact, I'm hoping none of them show up down here. I've had a lot of issues with them coming and climbing on me while I'm trying to do uh, teaching. Uh, thankfully, everyone's pretty um, tolerable, <laughs> tolerant uh, of, of that kind of thing during the pandemic. Um, but um, these fish eventually, um, once that yolk sac is absorbed, they switch on to a diet of um, initially feeding indiv on individual prey items and then eventually they develop those gill rakers and, and become that more filter feeding uh, species that um, I, I mentioned early, earlier. They um, eventually will migrate onto the ocean. This is a very complicated uh, story, which uh, you'd think that you'd just like leave, but it seems to be in waves. There seems to be an early group that leave somewhere in June, late June, early July. Then either because they choose to or because the next month, month and a half, we very often have very dry weather here in the Northeast and we often lose flow. Um, so I actually don't know which what it is. It could be either of those things. There's either a, a choice or some kind of adaptive reason why you have some that leave early and some that leave late, or it could just be purely physical, something that we're trying to, trying to tease apart. Um, so uh, they will leave in pulses, large pulses of fish um, out of the system. Um, and then they move out into the ocean. They remain, remain there for three to five years until they return for their first spawning event. They'll continue to repeat this cycle of returning and spawning as many years as they're alive. Their maximum age is about nine. Uh, you don't see fish that, lar that old um, really anywhere. There are a couple of systems that have some older fish in them, but for the most part, we've really, for all species actually that are targeted by fisheries, uh, you really reduce the, 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 um, the age in the population. And again, another topic, a topic for another talk, but um, just important to realize. So there's a series of moments throughout their life history that really can help us understand what's going on. And unfortunately, we really only have this moment of spawning. This is the spawning migration, which we have visual counters, um, citizen sci scientist counts, really helpful to have this information, right? But I think the question is, is this information collected once per year on the run at one life stage with actually mixed ages often, but you sometimes know a little bit about those ages. Is that enough to understand what's going on to these populations, both from climate change impacts, but also to, to give your management um, advice on what to do? Um, I'm gonna say that it's probably good enough to understand what's going on for the population in a rough sense, but I think it's absolutely not enough to understand climate change impacts or best management approaches because you're only capturing part of their life history, you just know that the number went up, 
but it, you don't know if it was because of something that happened while they were in fresh water. You don't know if it was because they were caught in, in ocean bycatch. You don't know if it was because of climate change. You don't know if it was because of lack of flow. You don't know, you really have no idea in their entire life cycle where that impact was. So this is what that data looks like in just one year at one system uh, being collected in this case by an electronic counter. Um, it catches the number of fish that you can so you can see how their their patterns of migration are occurring. You can also see that you can add this up for the entire year and that's the number that gives us that population census estimate. Um, I love to show video of what it actually looks like. Oh, and the volume's on, how great. Um, well, I'm just gonna let it play. Um, so, in this case, um, what we have are a series of adult river herring moving upstream. You actually see little small glass eels occasionally if the, if the video is of high enough quality for you, you can actually see them swimming there. Um, these little glass eels, American eels that are, are moving up into the systems at the same time as young um, because they're actually catadromous and spawn in the ocean, another topic for another talk. Very chaotic scene, right? So like this is what we're capturing as information, but we don't capture this other side. What are these young doing? What are they doing in these systems? When do they leave? Is there a good time to leave? Is there a bad time to leave? Are impacts of our activities in on land impacting these fish? We don't know that and we're only just starting to get a handle on it, our lab and, and other uh, labs like Karin uh, Lindbergh's. Um, at uh, SUNY ESF. So I'm just gonna run through a couple of the projects that we're working on, which you're, I encourage you to follow up with questions on if you have anything um, that you're interested in. So we work on the adult run using data collected by the Division of Marine Fisheries and citizen scientists across um, Massachusetts to understand what is driving patterns in the adult run. What is making it later? What is making it earlier? And so these are a series of, of sites um, and when the start of the run happened, when the median part of the run happened and when the end of the run happened trying to understand what is creating these patterns in that migration that then we can make, um, we can adapt our management in terms of either fishway maintenance or in terms of uh, dredging and um, other activities that occur in the coastal zone and make sure that we're adapting those to changes that are occurring within these populations. We're also looking at more directly, is it temperature or flow? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, but temperature definitely seems to drive uh, the migration. Um, and uh, th this, the, both these papers are in review right now. So um, I'll let them come out and then people can have uh, discussions about them um, when they're done. We have another other students who are continuing to work on like, what, are these patterns changing over time? Um, using other things like eDNA to try and pick up these fish as they move into these systems, especially systems that are hard to um, uh, monitor them in. We have other students who are working on like, what are these summer rearing conditions like? Are they good for survival? Are they bad for survival? Are there systems that are good? Are there systems that are bad? Are there conditions that can develop in any of these systems that are, are good or bad? It, we don't know that. And so understanding this is really important. So we have uh, my graduate student, Leon, who's working on uh, projects uh, uh, on a lab uh, based project and field based, trying to understand uh, sensitivity to, to temperature. Um, we also have my uh, graduate student, uh, uh, Matt uh, Devine, who is working on more on um, looking at the densities and growth rate of these fish um, in uh, the um, in the systems and how, what is driving patterns in growth, survival, mortality, and so forth. I have not looked at the Maine's plan on climate, I got to be honest. Um, but I will for the next time I give a talk in Maine. Um, we also don't know simple questions like how long do the adults stay in fresh water? What is the impact on adjacent ecosystems and local systems when you make these, uh, these changes? Um, whether you like add a fishway or to pull out a dam, are there, do the adjacent systems benefit from this or is it just that one? We really don't have an understanding of like how watershed scale impacts of restoration are, are playing out. The juvenile immigration is, we don't know anything about this. We have just touches of information about what is driving this immigration, why it occurs, when it is occurring. So Magna Majority, um, a PhD student who works with Allison Roy, I'm only on her committee, um, is working on this um, the most. And it's a very, very complicated story to capture the, the patterns in these really, really small fish. And then recently we, we got uh, that funding from Woods Hole Sea Grant to look at this estuary residence. And we really count on um, our ability to sample in, the, in, the, in, these, in these ponds and intercept them a little bit in the, during their um, migration downstream and then capture them also in the estuaries to understand like, 
is there a good time to leave? Is there a bad time to leave? Are the impacts of certain activities going to change the way that this that this occurs? And um, and then we have we work uh, very much again with the Division of Marine Fisheries, and this is Gary Nelson has developed um, a, a very complicated model, which I'm not going to get into in any detail. I'll just say that Gary makes about the most complicated models um, possible. Um, actually, Gary and my former advisor, Yong Chen at Humane, actually make the most complicated models I've ever seen um, or ever been mostly invo you know, involved with. Um, but uh, it's a really great model because it allows us to simulate what impacts in different parts of their lives may be. And so understanding this estuary component is a real gap in our understanding of their fish, of this fish. And, and then, of course, there's the offshore component, which is very hard to get funding for because it's not a NOAA priority. Um, you know, they have the cod and other things that are, are a problem. And um, and so it's just unfortunately river herring um, uh, research in the ocean is really um, lacking in a very significant way. And it's going to um, continue to really cause us problems in terms of understanding what's going on. Not only do we do that, we do a lot of ecosystem modeling. So this is a figure from my graduate student, Bia Diaz. This is a paper that is in review right now after the first round of revisions that's so just been resubmitted. And it looks at how changing the abundance of allocenes, so that little red, tiny little red dot, and by the way, these dots are the size of the biomass. So allocenes, the uh, three species of river herring, are tiny in biomass compared to Atlantic herring. But if you restore them, you re change the way that energy is flowing from the bottom part of this food web up to the top part of the food web, which includes those orange things, which are our fisheries. And so we think that, and, and the modeling that Bia has done demonstrates that habitat restoration is by far more effective at restoring river herring than anything you can do related to fisheries because fisheries target not only river herring, they target other things, often competitors. And so oftentimes when you reduce fishing, you actually increase the number of predators in the system because you don't like, for example, take out a bunch of young haddock um, in, your, in your nets. And so um, the impacts can be actually counterintuitive. And um, I think that the, the impacts of restoration are, are clearly going to be linear towards a uh, positive improvement. So I'm just going to end, like, that's the only data I'm really going to show. And I'm just going to say that I feel like we've, we have a long ways to go in terms of understanding um, the impacts of climate and of restoration. But I feel like we're getting on the right track after taking, frankly, about two or three years to realize that we don't know enough to, to even start where we, we had started with our proposals. We need to take some steps back and really some steps back and really understand some of the natural history of the species and how they're engaging in um, actions like predation and and um, and um, you know habitat use that are just really simple but we still don't really fully understand like what habitat do they use to spawn someone mentioned that the other day and we're just like ah, we don't really know we we have anecdotal evidence we have a little bit of information collected mostly by Wes Eakin at, uh, in the Hudson River but we really don't understand what is going on in, in those um, in those situations um, we don't know enough yet to really understand these climate impacts because we're still trying to piece together parts of their life history across their movements in the, uh, and they're very complex. The way that these movements occur are not uniform and each system seems very unique um, compared to the uh, adjacent systems. But it's engaged citizens like yourselves um, who are the key to the future success of whatever we do because ultimately it's going to require additional funding and pushing through um, ideas around river herring and their, their importance to coastal ecosystems that is going to drive the, the, the continued restoration of, of fresh water and um, uh, just I, I can't speak I, I try to say this as much as I possibly can, that we need to do a really good job reaching out to the younger um, audience because they are growing up in a very technologically based world. And I have concerns that um, there'll be a moment in history as there was a moment in history um, uh, hundreds of years ago where we where we shifted from thinking that these species were important and started fishing in the ocean um, um, once we had really impacted the, the freshwater um, habitat. And I'm worried that we will make a turn and sort of forget about the natural environment and just become um, you know, stuck in a, some kind of blockchain somewhere. And so I really um, I, I hope that we can do that uh, well. And um, it's groups like uh, what the Wells uh, Estuary uh, Reserve uh, Research Reserve that are going to be able to help us achieve that, those successes. So with that, I'll, I'll end and I'll just take these uh, few questions. So. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, we there is an impact of 
marine derived nutrients and we make some estimations of this um right i'm actually going to stop the share um so i can and you guys can turn your videos on now as well um so i can see your faces and it's not just this is like how i teach when i see just black boxes everywhere um never quite sure if anybody's actually out there listening um so we they're really interesting. So the big the big difference between um, Pacific salmon and Atlantic coast, um, both salmon and uh, river herring, is that um, Pacific salmon die in the watersheds, leave their bodies in those streams. Macroinvertebrates and invertebrates shred those in, uh, up into and actually get them into the food web. They actually even do more than that. They during spawning they they wipe rocks clean and do all kinds of neat habitat modifications. River herring are very different. They they don't typically die. They're not they're not their goal is not to die at the end of spawning. <laughs> um, they're trying to make it out again. Whether that's possible or not is a is a different story. But but for sure they are a species that um, during their excretion and feeding have the ability to move materials inland, but they also feed and forage while they're in fresh water and then remove things and bring them out. Another big difference between the anadromous and landlocked varieties, big difference. Um, so they do, they do a certain amount of marine derived nutrients, but they also export freshwater nutrients into the um, into the coastal systems. And there's a balance there that um, I'm sure you are aware is important uh, and uh, is a lot of discussion in Maine about that. And there's been some great work by um, Joe Zaliski and his group up at UMaine um, looking at sort of modeling those impacts. And, and we think as we get more and more information, we can inform the uh, escapement uh, numbers better um, in terms of you know, trying to make sure we don't import too many nutrients into these freshwater systems. And on that point though, I will mention that it is almost exclusively a nutrient addition from humans that is a problem in freshwater systems, not one of river herring bringing in um, the little bit of nutrients that they do. Um, yeah, that's a great question on cooperation. We try, I'll just say that. I mean, ultimately I, we're all competing for the same grants, so um, I think that there's just a natural competition there and there's no huge national effort to restore these kinds of species like there is, for example, Pacific salmon on the West Coast. And so you end up with like, you know, five or six organizations all trying to compete over the, you know, one and one and two hundred thousand dollar grants. So um, not a good way to set up a, a situation where there's going to be cooperation. However, I came from UMaine, that's where I did my graduate stu uh, studies. I know Joe Zaliski and I know uh, Mike Kinnison and Karen Wilson, and I know the whole group up there who work on River Herring and I am excited to collaborate with them. It's just, especially this year. I mean, I think we had a lot of, uh, and we, I was going to be working with them this year on um, doing some, expanding some DNA, eDNA sampling, um, but it's been just not, nothing happened this last year like we expected. So I'm hoping we can get back to that. And we have had some, um, some interactions uh, this year. So I hope we can get to a better place on the, the cooperation, but, I, but we also just need, we just frankly need more support um, for, I, I would say it's not just river herring, it's, it's smelt river herring and the suite of fish that, um, that are in these, um, you know, coastal ecosystems that we, we need more, f uh, financial support for research in that area because it's sort of outside of NOAA's jurisdiction. The states don't really work together on that. I mean, so it makes, just makes it really complicated to work on the species, uh, funding wise. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, well, that's a great question. So. I, I guess, uh, Sam, your question is on, uh, will they return to fresh water to spawn again? Do you mean within the same year or within different years, in different years? Both? <laughs> okay, so, um, so yeah, so we actually, um, we just recently published a paper and I think it was, it's probably two years ago now, um, Kelly McGarden at Stony Brook University where I was as a postdoc for a little while. We put uh, acoustic tags and pit tags in fish and found that they oscillated between the spawning grounds and the, um, and the estuary not all of them. It, it seemed to be about 30% of that population. And one of the things we're kind of learning is that, um, especially because I got reprimanded by my state colleagues who were like, we know that already. And I'm like, well, you should have published it. Um, and so, um, so we think that this happens in varying degrees in different systems. And we don't have a good handle on it, frankly. We, so there's some number that are, and probably if it's got a lot of dams in the system, the number of fish that do the moving to estuaries mm -hmm. probably gets reduced, right? I mean, it just logically um, but we don't know that um, and then absolutely if as long as they survive the entire year I mean remember these fish are a gauntlet <laughs> so have to pass through a gauntlet so um, they uh, they do end up uh, 
as long as they live, they will return the next year for, for spawning again. Yeah. And they'll repeat that. And, and some obviously are making these return trips to the estuary and then they go out in the ocean and they come back the next year and they do the same thing. We don't know how consistent that is. If it's a behavioral thing every year, those are where we are and our knowledge really starts falling apart. Great. Any other questions? Adrian, Katrina? did you see there was one from Nathan uh, right above Sam's question? Oh, sorry. Uh, what size difference? Oh, boy. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, the differential survival, that is just, that's our, like, kind of our holy grail, um, what we're trying to work for uh, towards. Um, so I have a lot of ideas on this, but I, I'm going to try to stick to just the facts. Um, we do not know if there's any advantage to leaving early or staying late. We have absolutely no idea. I would imagine it depends on the year. Because some years we get really bad droughts, and it, I, I think sometimes it just gets stuck in the systems. And so those years probably was better to get out of there. Um, but um, uh, the differences in size are stunning. Um, so we see fish that are leaving early are going to be in that uh, so we actually don't know because we hardly ever sample. The, these fish are very rarely sampled, but they're because of what we know in fresh water, those fish are going to be between 20 and 50, 60 millimeters. Uh, whereas some of the fish in uh, the late uh, departure from the systems are going to be over hundred millimeters in size. And then it just really depends on the system. Um, the paper that we, that my graduate student, Matt Devine just got published like last week, um, which is called feeling the squeeze. So if you put feeling the squeeze and then, you know, river herring, you'll, you'll find the paper. And if you're interested, I can send it to you. Um, the, that one shows that the densities of fish are really affected by the spawning, uh, the spawning numbers, as well as habitat quality. And the follow-up to that, which um, I'm going to somewhat steal Matt's thunder before you guys had published with what I'm about to say, but the follow-up to that suggests that actually, so sites that are low density, the fish grow really big. And so we get 100, 120 millimeter fish in low density systems. So that would actually be almost every system in Maine that is stocked. They stock them at really low rates, um, whereas uh, natural runs get very high densities of river herring. And I, I mean, like much higher densities. And we actually see declining growth in, in, at some point, um, and that's covered a little bit. The, dense, the declining densities and declining growth as those densities go up uh, higher. So we think there's a sweet spot in there, but we again, like you know, we just we don't really know quite what the benefits of either strategy are. Like, is it better to have two really big fat ones or 400 tiny little things. I don't know. I mean, we can model it with a whole bunch of assumptions and make a guess, but I actually think that it's going to, we're not, I'm not comfortable in going down that route yet in terms of modeling um, because I don't think we know enough. And I, I'm hoping by the time Matt's wrapping up, we, we get, um, we get enough years of data with different conditions that we can start asking questions about who those returners are and whether they're being, um, they're surviving better. I will only, just last thing on this, um, Sarah Turner, uh, who worked with Karin Lindbergh, she, her, her work suggested that it's better to leave early, um, but it's just a very small subset of years. And so I, I worry again about that, how different years may, may benefit different parts of the population. Most, most species have some kind of bet hedging or like they don't only do one thing. If you do one thing, you're gonna be in trouble in this changing environment. I don't think I've missed any questions. No, I think I think you got them all. And we're we're right at one o'clock, so that was perfect timing. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, and obviously, if, if anybody has any lingering questions or something occurs to you, you know, in your sleep tonight, <laughs> I'm kidding. Hopefully not. Hopefully you're thinking of something better than river herring at that point. Um, but. Uh, um, feel, feel free to send me an email. I'm, I'm pretty busy for the next uh, few days, but I do try and get uh, get back to people as quick as I can. Um, so if it takes me a few days, I'll my apologies. Um, but it, certainly if you're interested in certain papers or certain aspects, I can send you information um, that way. And Adrian, what's your email just in case people need that? It's ajordan, A-J-O-R-D-A-A-N at umass.edu. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for participating today. No Enjoy problem. the snow. Yeah, go out there and play. I, I, my kids are waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs>